insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 12. Punch it, Chewy. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, with my lovely and talented co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Michelle? I am fantabulous. How are you? I'm fantastic. So we are both decked out today in our special uh, Star Wars-themed shirts. And why is that? Because as of our recording, it is May the 4th also known as Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. And also with you. (laughs) Communion wafers will be later. (laughs) So we do have a good show for you today in our Disney Detective segment. We have some information on Hollywood Studios' uh, anniversary. We have our spoiler-filled review of Avengers Endgame, which we can do Spoiler filled since you we won't officially be airing the podcast until Monday when the Russell brothers have released <laughs> everyone from their cone of silence. I think that's funny. Uh, we'll have uh, some information on how well it pays to be a superhero, and then our entertainment news we'll talk a little bit about uh, Adele and some more on her split from her husband, some news on Skylar Aston and dating challenges and then we'll talk about uh, Rick Schroeder and some legal issues and then we will pay a touching tribute to the late great Peter Mayhew who we lost this week and then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week sounds good so let's get right into it so Michelle go for Disney detectives So, earlier this week, Hollywood Studios kicked off its 30th anniversary. Um, The park was originally Disney MGM Studios uh, when it originally opened back on May 1st uh, in 1989. They had a partnership with MGM. At the time, they were allowed to use um, different movies from their catalog. Obviously, one of the the original rides, which is no longer there now, is the Great Movie Ride. And for those uh, who had never been on it, it was kind of a uh, boat-ish type ride where you would ride through various movie scenes. And 98% of the movies were MGM movies from John Wayne classics uh, leading up to a big finale of uh, The Wizard of Oz um, and basically would take you you know, through the heyday of the, you know, of and Star Hollywood. Wars was in the sizzle reel too. Yes, Hollywood was, uh, Star Wars was, was in that uh, as well. Um, so when the park originally opened, it was meant to be a working studio, uh, kind of what Universal uh, was. So the idea was that they were going to have the animation department, then they were doing live action, certain movies were going to be shot there or at least part of it and honestly as time went on they kind of switched gears um and it wasn't until uh 2008 when they actually changed the name over to disney hollywood studios so it was a working studio at one point it was there they were doing some production um one of the original rides or attractions was a backlot tour and they would actually show you how they did special effects. Uh, They had uh, an area that was residential row where it was the facades of various houses um, that they had used like Golden Girls, the Golden Girls house was there and that was actually where they had filmed the front facades of the television show. 
Um, yeah, so there were certain things that were there um, back when the 90s version of the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse uh, was was on. It was filmed uh, there, so guests sometimes could actually go sit and watch um, shows being done. So um, they were done with a live studio audience? Mm-hmm, yeah, oh, wow. some of them were, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you also had the animation department that was there. Uh, I don't remember if there were any animation uh, animated movies that were completely done down in Florida, but a number of them had parts of the movie that were done. Certain parts were, were done. Um, and that was another tour that when you were walking through, you could actually look and see the animators you know, working on different things. And then again, over time, they kind of switched gears. They decided to bring in more rides. So you had uh, Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, um, Rock and Roller Coaster that came in. And obviously now it switched gears. So you have, you know, the whole Pixar area, obviously Galaxy's Edge. That's, you know. Galaxy's Edge, what's that? Yeah, that's this little part that, you know, they're just kind of adding a couple of little things. Um, so, you know, they, they did this big anniversary um, event. It was actually live streamed. Um, and the biggest thing that really came out of it was the new logo of the park, as you can see. Um, so they changed it up a bit. Um, and one of the other things that was kind of cool was that they um, actually did a preview of the cast member costumes of... Uh, for Galaxy's Edge. Um, so they had various different cast members um, in different uh, attire that you'll be able to see uh, the cast members wear. Um, but they did a whole uh, cavalcade with different characters, uh, as you can see, and then they had the Galaxy's Edge uh, cast members come out and showing, you know, showing that so now, when the park first opened wasn't it designed to capture a very specific era of Hollywood? yeah it was kind of like the 1930s uh it was the you know kind of the beginning of when walt you know got into hollywood and and you know and was producing you know the disney shorts the mickey mouse shorts um you know so the idea was that you know you were kind of the idea of the theme park was that you were either in 1930s Hollywood or you were, you know, backstage. Um, so where the Magic Kingdom is very particular about cast members from different lands never cross crossing into, you know, if you're in a Tomorrowland costume, you're never going to be in Adventureland. But the idea with Hollywood Studio was that on a working production site, you'd see a cowboy and a space ranger passing each other. Right. It, it wouldn't be uncommon. So they kind of, you know, you know, when you go on um, Star Tours and you're walking up to it, you see the AT-AT, you see the Ewok Village, and then if you happen to walk through the queue and you look, you're actually seeing the backside of it where the it's not complete, the superstructure, and, yeah. and the whole it's idea... Just a facade. Right. The whole idea of the whole park was to be able to see the back, the back lot stuff that you right. would normally, you know, not see. So unfortunately, you know, they kind of got away from a lot of that because that was really more their original ideas. Um, but they still have, you know, some of them, you well, know, some of the throughout. things that were in the park were throwbacks too, were they not? Like the Brown Derby, for instance. Right. They had the Brown Derby restaurant, which was, you know, a takeoff of the original Brown Derby, you know, out in, in Hollywood, California. You know, the buildings were have that look to it. Um, they had uh, character actors that would walk up and down the street and interact right. with you who were you know, from the 1930s type type thing. So it, it definitely had a different feel for it, you know, the park originally. And now it's kind of shifted gears. Again, you have the whole Toy Story area. You have, you know, the Star Wars area. Then uh, Playhouse Disney kind of has their own area now, um, you know, and they used to have, you know, a bunch of different stunt shows or things that, 
showed you how they do stunts now. They just have the Indiana Jones stunt show, which is still a, a good show. It's just they've never changed it in, you know, the twenty something years that that they've had it. So well, you know, thirty years in a park, things are things are going to change. It's oh, absolutely, really and and they realized that they needed to change that it wasn't, you know, the right fit. And attendance obviously went up once you know they made the change. So. Yeah. So it'll cool. be interesting to see, you know, where the next 30 years go. Cool. Well, hopefully with Galaxy's Edge and a lot of the Pixar stuff, mm-hmm. they've got a bright future. Yeah, sure do. <laughs> what could that be? So, what could we be talking about next? So what did we do last weekend? Um, hmm. What did we do last weekend? I don't know. Did we go see a movie? We did indeed. <laughs> so, yes, we did get out on uh, premiere weekend to go see uh, Avengers Endgame. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone has been under a bit of a gag order, I guess we could say. Depends um, on who you talk to. <laughs> true. There have been, there've been some folks who have not abided by it, but it was actually put out by the Russo brothers who directed the movie and basically asked people not to spoil that. That's kind of funny. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and they actually came out on, um, uh, good morning, America, good morning, America. And basically said, all right, two weeks in, we can lift the band. You can finally talk about it now. It's okay. (laughs) Right. If you weren't a diehard fan, you you're the ones that are you know finally getting around to seeing it you know after the fact where if you were diehard you needed to know you would have made time to yeah. to go and see it and i gotta tell you monday morning was tough for me because only one person in my company that i talk to frequently went to see it so mm-hmm. i had to keep my mouth shut the whole week right right yeah i had uh four people that had had gone to see it and and you know we had little side conversations and i was actually being very um uh, cautious in what I said to other people around because I didn't know who else around wanted to go see it. So I, I, I was actually being uh, trying to be nice and and not saying too much too loudly for those you know those around. Um, but I think by now everybody that you know that I work with has has seen it or um, really didn't care. You know it was like uh, well just tell me I might not see it for a couple of months so. So that so, was, that was kind of cool. So we have seen it, and I obviously know what your impression is, but for the sake of our audience, give us your impression of the movie. Wow. It was a roller coaster. Yeah. Um, from beginning to end, you know, it, it didn't let up. Um, you know, the slow parts weren't really slow. They were very emotional, and, you know, there was something to be taken away, you know, from it. The action scenes were were fantastic. Um, just the the way that you know they they coupled up certain characters and you know almost and like those characters that were coupled should have their own television series. Kind of, sort of, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, but yeah, it it honestly it didn't seem like a three hour movie. Um, it's a good thing though that we went in and did not opt for refreshments <laughs> or drinks. Um, Our daughter was not very happy about that. No, you no. got the you got I the got the evil eye. You for got that. the evil eye the entire time. Uh, but the funny thing was, even the slow parts, you couldn't get up and use the restroom on because there was too much information and emotion right that was conveyed during the slow part and i believe that the app that a lot of people use for when they go to the the movies to be able to go run p run p um they actually didn't even have from what a friend of mine told me they didn't even have it up until uh sunday or monday um you know but basically now i've never used the app but from what he told me not only does it tell you when you can get up and go to the bathroom but it'll actually give you a synopsis of what you're missing as if your friend was telling you right so that you know but yeah you know like i said and like you said it, it really even in the slow parts it wasn't slow it was there was something to be taken from that you know that scene yeah you know yeah and, and you know it it progressed quickly at the beginning mm-hmm. you know you you see 
heroes are rescued, villains are decapitated, um, and then you sort of hit a brick wall. Yeah, and now what do we do? Yeah. Like, um, okay. And from there on, it was from that, there's a five-year jump in the movie if you haven't seen it yet. From that five-year jump, it's a fan fest at that point. Yeah. It really is. You get flashbacks to behind-the-scenes look at previous movies, mm-hmm. you know, Thor and previous Avengers. Right, right. Um, you sort of see what happened in the shadows that you didn't see in the mm-hmm. movie, and it was very well done. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see certain consequences happen that didn't develop there, but you'll see later on that were great setups for later on. Mm-hmm. Um, and throughout the movie, they dotted the I's and crossed the T's Absolutely. and summed up everything that needed to be summed up. Yeah, it, it almost seemed like there were very few things that you needed to have explanations for. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and there have been obviously many sites um, that have come out afterwards, you know, giving a little bit more explanation. But in a lot of cases, I don't think you needed it for the movie. Now, right. again, a friend of mine from work, originally he was kind of disappointed. He, You know, he said it was a good movie, but it could have been better. But then he showed me this, this one website that basically questions were answered by the Russo brothers. Yeah. Like, you know, well, what happened with this and what happened with this? And after reading the explanations, he felt a little bit better. So for him, the movie went up, you know, he was probably at like a seven or eight. It went up to a 9.25 in his mind. And for him, if they would have explained some of that stuff in the movie, then, you know. Well, and that's the thing. As stingy as the Russo brothers were with information prior to the movie, They've been incredibly generous. Oh, absolutely! Filling like, in the blanks, filling that in all had, the blanks, which has like, just enhanced the movie even more. Absolutely, and I and I could almost see them doing a director's cut. Yeah, you know when it comes out on on DVD, yeah. where you know, like here's you know here's the explanation of you know at the end of this scene, this is what we you know this is what we wanted to convey, or yeah. you know this is where you need to think. Oh, where did this person end up going? He took this. Hmm, did he really die? Did he not right. really die? Or you know, and it was an emotional roller coaster on many levels. It wasn't just. You know, a death of a person right. or a reunion. I mean, they ran the gamut of emotions, you know, and they tweaked all the right chords right. to get all the right emotions out of you during and, the course and, of that movie. And, you know, the characters that needed to finally say a goodbye. Yeah. You know. You're welling up already. I'm just thinking of the scene. The, the scene. <laughs> Because it was that damn good. It was that damn good. You know, the fact that you you saw in in Iron Man, um, you know, he always wished he could go back and talk to his dad. Yeah. And and have that last moment with him. And here he did. And he took advantage of it. And, you know, everybody was like, wow. That yeah. Was, it was. That it, was rough. It was very well done. Yeah. You know, I give it a 9.5 out of 10. Uh, and the point five is just sort of some of the loose ends that they t- they mm-hmm. didn't tie up. They use kind of a cheat, and right in your and, and, right. That, and that cheat is exploitable. And they haven't really explained away how they're not going to take advantage of it again. Right. You know, anytime you throw that, and if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Right. Right. Uh, I don't want to spoil it for everybody, but if you anytime, <laughs> even though you've already spoiled, but it's okay. A- anytime a a sci-fi or pop culture thing uses mm-hmm. that particular cheat um it's a convenient way to handle plots right how do you undo right and never use it again right you know, there you, should you... have been consequences to the way that it was used so right it couldn't be reused right i could totally see that you know and and maybe that's something they will explain you right. know that you know something you know somebody did something in the past yep that you know now that no longer exists going forward so you don't have you know that option to do it but a tremendous amount of character development in mm-hmm. this 3 hour film yeah that was the culmination of 21 movies and 10 years of character mm-hmm. development yeah yeah um, just very very well done hats off 
to the cast and the crew mm-hmm. uh, for really putting together the movie that everyone deserved and exceeding expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it doesn't come without its own rewards, right? Nope, not at all. So that brings us to our next segment, our next article. So it definitely pays to be a superhero. So uh, coming out of, obviously, Endgame, it was kind of interesting to see some interesting facts um, of how much money some of the uh, lead stars made, not only for this movie, but what they originally had made in in some of the movies versus now. So Scarlett Johansson, as you can see, um, for her first appearance, she made $400,000. Now that was in Iron Man 2, right? I believe so, in Iron Man 2, right. And for this, well, actually for her solo movie, which will be coming out, she'll be taking home $15 million. That is so, a significant jump. Not a bad uh, pay increase. Um, let's talk about Thor. Uh, he took home, for the original Thor, he took home $150,000, and now he's making $15 million as well. That's a nice chunk of change. And it was interesting, he came in at one of the lowest in in, in his solo film mm-hmm. because he was such a fresh face and didn't have right. the experience coming in. Right, and now... I mean, you figure you're highlighting a Marvel Cinematic movie and you're mm-hmm. only making 150000 before bonuses, obviously. Right, right. And that's the other thing, too, is now you have, you know, so many of the different bonuses and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Chris Evans, now he actually started off a little bit higher. America's ass. <laughs> It's just awesome. Um, <laughs> he scored a million dollars for the original Captain America. And, of course, now he's also at fifteen. You know, millions. But is so, that what the most people are making out of this? Is fifteen? No, million? absolutely not. So our final one would be obviously Iron Man himself, Robert Downey Jr. So for the original Iron Man, he actually was making half a million dollars. Right. Seventy-five million dollars. Now. That's that's impressive. And and you know. A lot has to be said for Robert Downey Jr. because mm-hmm. when he came in and took on the role as Iron Man, mm-hmm. he was resurrecting his career from oh, absolutely. Substance when you abuse when and... you look back at and and there have been many memes. You know, he he went to jail. He did jail yeah. time. He was in rehab. You know, a lot of people didn't even expect him. To survive. To survive, to be alive. Yeah. And, you know, to to see what a success he's made for himself. Um, and honestly, I can't imagine anybody else playing Tony Stark. No, no, you, you know that history that he had is what made him Tony exactly. Stark. Exactly. And that and that's you know, so And it, and the one thing I have to say, yeah, he's pulling a lot of money. That's seventy five million base before before bonuses. Mm-hmm. He not only did he embrace this character, I think he credits this character for saving his life. Oh, absolutely. And, and he has become an entirely different person. Mm-hmm. He is he's eaten up the persona mm-hmm. of Iron Man. Not necessarily Tony Stark. Right. That's who he was. Right. He's eaten up the presence of Iron Man. The charitable events that he's I was he's just done, gonna say the charities that he does when you see him the way that at, he is with the kids. At the children's hospitals. Yep. You know, that that's, he, you know. He's taken on the role of a absolute, superhero. Yeah, absolutely. And kids look up to him. He appreciates that. Mm-hmm. Uh, he embraces it. And he uses that notoriety and that stardom to really make a difference. And I credit him totally for that. Yeah, absolutely. The other interesting thing to note about um, these salaries is that... Um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has actually set the bar for bonuses right. in movies. Prior to the success of these movies, bonuses started kicking in around a half a million dollars revenue for a movie. Now it's up to $1.5 billion before mm. bonuses start kicking in because that's how much money these movies actually are pulling in on a regular basis. Right, so right. They've redefined <laughs> what it is to Their make a blockbuster scale. movie. Yeah, yeah. So that was that's some pretty cool stuff there. Yeah. 
So I think that's what we had for Disney Detective. Yep, that Let's is it. Move on to entertainment news. Okay. And I will defer to you for this one, dear. Okay, so there were a couple of little updates uh, to uh, some stories we had talked about a couple of weeks ago with uh, celebrity divorces. Uh, the one was actually kind of kind of funny, kind of cute. Uh, Adele who obviously has split from her husband, shared a funny meme uh, of herself uh, post-breakup. She hadn't been on Instagram in a while, um, and so she posted uh, this meme, as you can see, uh, when you catch yourself uh, in your feelings when you remember who you are. Um, And the one picture was from a couple of years ago, you know, very emotional, and then the other one was uh, more recent of her uh, in a much better place. Um, so it had been about two weeks um, after uh, Us Weekly had confirmed the divorce that she finally uh, returned to Instagram. Um, they actually broke up about nine months ago. Um, but, you know, they're, you know, still raising, decided uh, to raise their son together. Um, but it was just kind of kind of cute that um you know that she was able to poke fun at herself uh an insider had said that they realized that there wasn't any romantic love anymore um they're disappointed that it just didn't work out but again you know here she she's poking fun at herself so that that was kind of cute um and then also in our updates of celebrities getting divorced uh we had talked also around that same time skylar astin um and his uh, wife, Anna Camp, had filed for divorce. And now it seems, according to Us Weekly, that he has now joined a dating site. Um, it's kind of funny because this is a, a dating site that actually you have to get approval from to join. Um, and it seems that it's an anonymous committee um, that is based on part of what your Instagram activity is. Uh, it seems to be very highly celebrity based uh, or people in the industry. So I guess I can't join. Huh? No, I guess okay. you can't join. Uh, some previous uh, members had been uh, Jeremy Piven, Matthew Perry, and Chelsea uh, Handler have, have used this app before. So it was kind of interesting to see, you know, about two weeks or so after their divorce, you know, became public already on the dating site. Throwing your hat back in the arena there. Yeah, I guess More so. More power to you. Yeah guess so um so in other news uh this was kind of kind of sad uh ricky schroeder was arrested for domestic violence and it seems not only for one incident but within 30 days this was actually his second incident um of domestic violence uh it seems that uh there was an incident that took place on april 2nd at his home with an unnamed woman and then again the same woman another incident uh had occurred um it's not yet clear what charges he could face um but again this was the second uh second offense in just 30 days um he's kind of been out of the spotlight for well i guess not too long 2016 was the last uh time he had been in anything obviously for anybody uh that's been around uh he was obviously very popular in the 80s uh in silver spoons uh he actually his his first film was actually the champ in 1979 which he actually won a golden globe uh for that performance and he's done you know a couple of different things here here and there um in 2016 he and his wife actually filed for a divorce after being married for 24 years so again kind of you know hasn't been doing you know too much but kind of unfortunate you know that he's making headlines you know for this it's a long way to go from uh silver spoons right? yeah absolutely And the last thing that we have today in our entertainment news is the sad news of Peter Mayhew. I can't talk either. (laughs) And you're welling up. Um, 
Yeah, this this definitely came to a shock. Um, they actually announced it a couple of days after um, he had passed. But according to his agent, Peter Mayhew had passed away on April 30th. He was 74 years old. Uh, he is survived by his wife, Angie, and their three children. He played Chewbacca in the original trilogy, as well as episode three of the prequels uh, and The Force Awakens, and also uh, was consulting on The Last Jedi to help teach his successor. Um, as of right now, a memorial service will be held for the fans on June 29th, and in early December, I'm guessing right before the new movie comes out, um, a memorial will be held in Los Angeles for fans. And tributes, obviously, were pouring out all over the place um, from fans and colleagues. Um, Mark Hamill, obviously, posted, He was the gentlest of giants, a big man with an even bigger heart who never failed to make me smile, a loyal friend who I love dearly. I'm grateful for the memories we shared, and I'm a better man for just have knowing him. Thanks, Pete. Um, Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, said Peter was larger than life in so many ways. A gentle giant playing a gentle giant. Rest in peace. And Kathleen Kennedy, who is the president of Lucasfilm, said, When I first met Peter during The Force Awakens, I was immediately impressed by his kind and gentle nature. Peter was brilliantly able to express his personality through his skillful use of gesture, posture, and eyes. We all love Chewie and have Peter to thank for that enduring memory. The one thing that I can say about Peter Mayhew is he was always very gracious mm -hmm. to, the, to the fans. And it's a shame. He was he was a great guy. And uh, he will be missed. Yeah, I know this weekend he was actually supposed to be at a um, Dallas-based convention. Um, and somebody had posted a couple of pictures because his table was set up. He still had his name plate set up on the backdrop. And they actually ended up turning it into a memorial. And so they had flowers and pictures and various fans had, had left stuff there for him. So I thought that was very, very sweet. Never miss an opportunity to interact with the fans. Yeah. Punch it, Joey. <laughs> As we compose ourselves <laughs> after that, uh, that segment there. We should have just ended with that. Uh, yeah, we really should have just ended with that. <laughs> but anyway, we, we will we end will go with on. our... We will go on. We will end with our insightful picks. And as always, my dear, I will defer to you. Okay, so my insightful pick of this week uh, is actually a CW show. <gasps> not, not Netflix. Not again. Netflix. <laughs> you are boycotting Netflix, aren't you? Yeah, maybe not. Ne maybe next week I'll I'll, I'll bring it back. This will teach them to raise the rates. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this happens to be one of my favorite shows um, on the CW. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, it's also in its final season. Um, originally, actually, it wasn't supposed to uh, have one more season. Season four was actually supposed to be. Uh, the last season. I guess I should actually say the name of the show. It's I Zombie. Um, uh, it's kind of funny because it came out right around the time that other various zombie type shows came out. You know, Walking Dead kind of started the zombie trend, you know, on television and all these other, you know, shows kind of came out. So why do we think it's in its last season? It is. But Why? You mean why? Because I started watching the last <laughs> season. So, you know. Right. So. Never ask me to watch a show you like. <laughs> right. Joe, Joe is kind of known uh, for starting to watch a show after I've already watched it, liking it, and then 
a couple months later finding out that it gets canceled. I am Joe the show killer. Right. So I normally try and watch a show and not have him watch it. So um, let's see. Santa Clarita Diet. He started watching it. I killed that one in record time, didn't I? <laughs> that one, the, the season, you know, on Netflix had just started and literally a month after it it premiered its its third season, done. Um so <laughs> yeah, so Joe started watching iZombie last season, um, and then a couple months into it, they announced that it was gonna get can you know, that they were stopping it after season four, but then they decided, no, let's do one more season, kind of tie up the loose ends. So I'm kind of, you know, happy and sad. Um, so the new season actually just started on May 2nd, again, on the CW. It's actually loosely, uh, uh, it's a loose adaptation of the comic I Zombie. Um, so they took some liberties, obviously, with it. Now, did you read the comic? No, I never did. I never actually knew that it was a comic. But it's kind of interesting because when they show... Uh, the uh, the series they actually have you know comic yes graphics the in the background and, yeah. and things like that like uh, the opening credits are done based off of uh, a comic as well and they, um, they chapter each segment of the show right and the they comic, have yeah so so it is kind of cool um, so the story is that there's a uh, medical resident. Olivia, who is turned into a zombie after going to a party. Um, a couple of other people are turned into zombies, but everybody doesn't know about it. They're all kind of in hiding. So she decides to abandon her career of becoming a doctor. She breaks up with her fiance. Nobody understands why. And she ends up working for uh, the medical examiners, basically working in the morgue realizing that she needs to eat brains to survive. Um, and then uh, a, 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 throughout the series, certain people start finding out about her and helping her. And then you find out that there are more people that were infected um, and it just kind of keeps growing. And now in the last uh, season, it basically became worldwide that everybody knew that zombies existed. And they basically had to quarantine the town, um, the city. Well, yeah, Seattle's really a city. Right. <laughs> no more Starbucks. <laughs> no more Starbucks. Um, so you have, you know, half of the population are zombies, half the population are still humans. Our food. Our food, uh, you know, trying to, to incorporate, you know, but it was kind of interesting in the first couple of seasons because you didn't know who was a you know, a zombie and who wasn't, um, and, you know, various different things. One of the things that has always been hysterical is that anytime um, the zombies eat brains, you take on the personality of that person's brain. Um, so there, you know, there were times when um, the character Liv, she ate the, you know, the brains of an airhead. So she, you know totally became this like ditzy girl and then she, it was a drill instructor so she was you know very forceful in in her way um or you know so she takes on this other persona and for the whole episode of of the show she's this other you know this other person um in this last week's uh in the series uh premiere the medical examiner, who's kind of a zombie but not, um, he ate <laughs> uh, brains of somebody that was um, uh, a mobster who was uh, an, like, enforcer. an enforcer, and that was his total persona, you know, the entire show, where if you watch it, you see that he's totally not that. He's totally a pussycat. So, you know, having him, you know, get all upset and mad and wanting to rough somebody up, it, it was kind of funny to, to see you know, the interaction and, you know, because the character is never the same, you know, each week because right. obviously whoever, you know, whatever brain they consume, you and know, the premise takes is, on. That, is that she was eating the brains to solve the crimes of the people that were murdered. Right, right. That was how it, it first started out. And it was kind of like, you know, she was using a psychic ability. That's how she could kind of explain herself without anybody knowing Right. what she originally, you know, what she was in the original uh, first couple of seasons. Okay. Good pick. Well, it was. <laughs> it still I is. Watching it. <laughs> <clears throat> so 
So my pick this week, I go back to podcasts. This one is a professionally produced podcast presented by Red Hat, who is now owned by uh, IBM, I believe. Uh, the podcast is called Command Line Heroes. Uh, and again, caveat, my idea of entertainment is different than many other people's. So for me... We're all allowed to have our own thing. Exactly. For me, watching a an original podcast about people who transform technology from the command line up is entertaining. Uh, the podcast tells the epic true tales of how developers, programmers, hackers... Geeks and open source rebels are revolutionizing technology landscape. You rebel scum. It is hosted by Sharon Gidbarak, a developer herself and founder of Code Newbie, uh, the most supportive community of programmers and people learning to code. Uh, they currently have two seasons. Each season is about eight episodes. Uh, season one starts out with an in-depth look at the operating system wars from Microsoft and Apple to the rise of Linux, uh, goes into great details on containers, agile development, DevOps, and cloud computing. Uh, season two picks up with uh, the early game development over ARPANET back in the 70s and 80s, and goes into the history of programming languages and continues on to the advocacy for the open source development. Since it's presented by Red Hat, it really is designed to showcase their open source community and their open source uh, agenda and philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of things to learn there between the very well-researched presentations, the insightful interviews with industry insiders, and a knowledgeable and friendly host. The show takes on some very complex technical concepts and ideas, mixes in a solid history of... of uh, information technology and spits it all out in really an easy to follow uh, entertainment style um, question and answer type session. Mm -hmm. um, a novice IT or programming individual could benefit from a lot of the information that's presented here. Uh, but some of it gets pretty deep into weeds. So folks who aren't technology oriented might not find it mm -hmm. uh, as useful, although there's there's certainly historical background if you're okay. interested in getting into that field. Uh, it's very well researched and, and presented. Uh, and I personally find it uh, very enjoyable. Okay, good. That's uh, Command Line Heroes presented by Red Hat. It's available on all major podcasts, including Apple, Google, Spotify, and others. Awesome. And I think that uh, does it for us for I this week. I think so. That was a, a emotional ride. Sure was. And uh, we'll be back next week with another great podcast. Bye. Bye.